set material. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Set material to promoted variable. Highlight mat. And because it'll bother me if I don't do this, setting material to highlight material and right now we're going to leave that as a null value all right let's get the highlight material and we're going to call it highlights okay so this was the next part uh, of the chain of stuff that I did earlier um, and it kind of got a little crazy, but I finally figured it out uh, with the help of Andrew, Andrew Hurley, if you uh, see him on the forums or answer hub. I'm going to put a 10 in here. We're going to stick this right in specular. Now keep in mind, specular and I think metallic cannot go together. It's either that or specular and roughness, but I think it's metallic. And do that. Do opacity. I'm going to come into highlights, take this, and we're going to move it down to translucent. Because so I do not technically want it to be what it was. Now, I'm going to go with three, three. Now, for these purposes, because all of these material or things share effectively, same material, and this will be good for demonstration purposes. Um, ideally, what you're going to want to do is have this material change based on. Actually, I can convert that to a parameter. Let's see. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, so this is other OBJ color. Now, what's great is, let's say you're using textures instead. You can convert this to a parameter instead. Boom, and then you can use textures. So, in this case, we're using uh, just a vector three, but know that you can do this with textures. I'm just not, I'm just choosing not to do so um, because it's not quite as necessary. But what I need is to come in here and get the default value and I want to open up the color picker which is uh, amazing. I, I love the color picker. And you see set SRG, uh, RGB for this I'm going to get this eyedropper, drag it right on top of here, and boom. So now you'll notice this actually auto populates with the information from the color of this box. Cool, huh? Okay. And we're going to update this to a parameter and go highlight color. And then we're going to lerp. Boop. And we need to go ahead and get a single value for the alpha. And what's important to note in uh, lerps, for those of you who have never, ever messed with them before, what a lerp does is it scales the value between A and B based on what you give your alpha. So in this case, it's zero. Zero represents A. So it is 100% A. If I were to put this at one, it would be 100% B. 
and we're actually going to go ahead and give this a color so that you can see that. Or it's going to choose to be a douche. Let me do this. And we'll set this to one for now so that we can see. So as you can see, it's a one. If we go here. It'll be gray. Now what we want is about 0.75 ish, I think. Yeah, so we want mostly green. And then, that's where this part comes in. This is another thing kind of like alpha with opacity. One represents fully solid. Zero represents fully transparent. Well, we pretty much for now at least want right in the middle. So it's kind of transparent, but kind of not. Sounds good? Sounds great. Now, we're going to come in here. We're going to go to our highlight mesh. I'm actually going to set this to 1.05. Um, so the what I'm doing here is I'm going to the scale transform and bumping up the scale of the highlight mesh just slightly, just bigger than the original mesh. And there's a reason for that. There's also a reason that I'm taking this highlight mesh going visibility. Down here, set visibility. Check, not check, boom. I'm also going to take this highlight mat, make it uh, very visible. So, hit save, compile, save, boom. So now we could actually, if we really wanted to, we could change this and it wouldn't matter. But we're specifically going to use the highlights that we have. So now when I come over here, boom. Now the reason we did everything the way we did it was so that you could still see the object inside of this other object. Now it's still a bit high on the opacity range, like I'm pretty sure I'm gonna I'm gonna lower that so that it's a bit easier to see through. Um, probably make the green a bit brighter actually on this one. But now we could actually if we're not right next to it, it's like it's not being bothered with. And what's great is this can become an instance mesh. So come in here and go container underscore inst. Then I'm going to make another one. Pickups underscore inst. Oh, come in here. Yeah, it's that bright obnoxious color. Sorry. I'm going to make it another bright obnoxious color. Let's go with blue. No, purple. I want purple. And then I'm going to leave the other OBJ color just because it, for, for this example, um, and I'll explain why we did this specifically. Um, but for this example, it's not really necessary. So this one's going to be pick up inst. This one's going to be container inst instead of just highlights. Finalize that. So now if we run over here, it is surrounded by a purple glow. And if we come over here, it's surrounded by a green glow. It's actually a very simple way to do this. So this is like the, holy shit, I don't have an artist. I need some way to show that this object can be picked up. I need some way to show that this object can be interacted with, and I don't want them to look the exact same. Hey, John Alcatraz, the problem with this, and I, I want to state this very clearly, 
is now you have two static mesh actors with all of their polygons rendering instead of one. That is why it is actually more efficient to do this through a material and what you basically do is you take the scene depth and you you kind of like pull information out of that and do a bunch of math that I don't know how to do yet. Um, and you basically create an outline through the post-process volume to show when you have certain objects that can interact with that, it'll have a little outline around it instead of doing it this way. I haven't done that yet because I'm not very good with materials, uh, but it is on my to-do list and that's how we're going to be doing it eventually. This is kind of just a, just a temporary, hey, this is how this is done. Um, and this is a perfectly valid way to do it. It's just not as performance uh, savvy. It's definitely more performance heavy to do it this way because you're effectively rendering all of those polygons twice to do the same thing. And if you have a super complex material, then it gets even worse. Um, especially, let's say you have, you know, a, I don't know why you would ever do this, but let's say you have like a 5,000 polygon, you know, treasure chest of X, you know, X blah, 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 blah. And then you do a highlight of that. So you, you render that, then you render another thing and they have complex materials. So then you have to worry about the complex materials rendering on two 5,000 polygon swords instead of just going, oh, well, get a material, outline it. Once I figure out how to do that, I will replace it. And John, you are right. It would, it will absolutely look better. The, this is absolutely programmer art, uh, art level stuff. It's more my, my speed for, for artistic talent, <laughs> but it is cool. I enjoy it. Now about this whole cursor, not working thing. So I need to, th I need to figure out That was actually one of the considerations we made, uh, Sterlingy, was, um, and actually uh, Rudy at work decided to make a practical example because we got into an argument over which one would be more efficient, because uh, neither of these are particularly efficient, but we, we actually got into an argument over which one was more efficient. And his idea was to keep an object that every time you hovered your mouse over another object, it would spawn a... Uh, it would either spawn or change the static mesh of an actor just behind it and rotate with the camera so that it's always sticking behind it and always has that glow effect but isn't actually around the object. Um, the problem I see with that is then you're constantly updating and destroying objects instead of just having them already in the level. And if you do that, then you're running all of that begin play process. Then you're running all, you know, any other functionality that you've got on that over and over and over and over and over again instead of having it run once. Um, now, typically that's not too bad, but then you've got people who, and it's kind of hard to see here with my mouse, but you've got the users who will go like this all over the place and just keep doing that. And then what you have to think about is going, okay, well, that's every time that swipes, that's create, destroy, create, destroy, create, destroy, create, destroy, create, destroy, blah, 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 boom, 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 over and over and over and over and over again. So, um my concern was that that would be more performance heavy actually than just having the object in the level and invisible and then just when you come up to it set it visible when it's not uh when you leave it set it invisible instead of creating and destroying it over and over and over again um let's see yeah that's actually um john alcatraz that's that's what i was considering my thing was i wanted to be able to actually like if you come up to uh, let me Oh god, it's doing its thing again. My computer has been acting kind of funny today, today, so this may be crashing. Ah, oh, there we go. Stop. Hit play. Hit finally. There we go. So, what I wanted to do was to come in here, and you can actually still see the object underneath, but it hasn't changed the material color of the original static mesh. It's only on the outside one, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to be highlighted, but that you could still see the original mesh. Um, and if you just add a new color to the original material, then what you're, uh, you, you fundamentally change the original material to where it's...